1971, comedic writer William Peter Blatty released a novel which swept the nation by storm. In 1973, a movie based on the book came out which Blatty wrote as well. The film holds as one of the highest grossing movies of all time. And that Oscar season, Blatty won the Academy Award for Best Adaptation. The winner is William Peter Blatty. This record-breaking film, which in my opinion is the greatest movie of all time, is known as The Exorcist. Warner Brothers distributed the films to the franchise, and after the massive success of the original movie, they pushed out a sequel in 1977, just four years later. Neither Blatty nor the original director, William Friedkin, were on board. To say that the sequel was terrible would be an understatement. But six years later, in 1983, William Peter Blatty released the true sequel to The Exorcist, a novel titled Legion. Legion, in turn, was released as a motion picture in 1990, titled The Exorcist 3. And as of right now, Exorcist 3 The Collector's Edition is available on Blu-ray, including a director's cut formerly lost by the production company Morgan Creek. Exorcist 3 isn't your standard cash grab horror sequel that we're used to seeing time and time again. Exorcist 3 pulled in Aliens and changed its genre. It's not a follow-up horror film with demonic possession in the foreground again. It's a psychological thriller. Two different people committed these murders? It's a detective movie with the paranormal activity following behind it. Our main protagonist now is Lieutenant Bill Kinnerman, who is in the first Exorcist trying to solve the death of Burke Dennings, who had pulled Damien Karras for help. He grows kind of close to Damien in his investigation, and in Exorcist 3, they ended up being good friends. He was my best friend. I loved him. The beginning of Exorcist 3 marks the anniversary of Damien's plummet down the M Street steps. And when the people tied to the exorcism off M Street start showing up dead, Kinnerman is put in a downward spiral trying to solve the murders of the people around him, whilst nearly losing his patience, his temper, and his mind. You make a lot of people nervous. Only sinners. Everybody! Is everything all right in here, guys? We're fine! Kinnerman bends, but he doesn't break. I'm just tired. He is a true hero, just like everyone in the original film, and he's one of the main reasons why Exorcist 3 is the greatest psychological thriller of all time. This film is a successful combination of several elements, one of them being humor. I brought your hamburger, Father. I'm not hungry. You need half. It's from Clyde. Where'd the other half come from? Space, your native country. Who stuck this guy? Nice and peaceful here, isn't it? Idyllic. Father President? Good morning, John. Backaches. Do we really have to have our own Olympics? Any plans today, Joe? This afternoon, I'm at the Flicks. It's a wonderful life. Very nice. Seen it 37 times. That's commendable. Do you have a favorite picture? The fly. Hmm, I wonder why that guy said that. This film is just funny. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you told me there's nothing really wrong with you. There isn't. My brother Eddie had these same stupid symptoms for years. Your brother Eddie died at the age of 30. Blatty can write comedy. He's done so in the past. You're looking at my medal, Hud. Stop looking at my medal. No, I'm not. Yes, you were. You covered it. The following morning. Isn't it beautiful? Yes, it's very nice. Son of a bitch. And I'm glad he chose to incorporate more into this story. Shouldn't you be reading from the Gospels or something? They don't give you all the fashions. Uh, this is true. Damn right. It's a welcome change from the original film, which featured barely any. Yeah, it's true, you do look like a boxer. Like John Garfield, in body and soul. Exactly, John Garfield. People tell you that, Father. Do people tell you you look like Paul Newman? Always. But the original's intentions was to keep us on edge from start to finish, and it meets that goal, because right after our joke, we're creeped the fuck out. Burke Dennings, good father, was found at the bottom of those steps leading to M Street with his head turned completely around, facing backwards. And as much as Exorcist 3 is humorous and settling, it's just as unsettling and frightening. Exorcist 3 sets up the mood and atmosphere by building off the world created in the first film, and it does so extremely effectively. Their shots of the Exorcist steps are nerve-wrenching non-orchestral score with some other callbacks to the franchise like tubular bells. Even the transitions are scary. Because if I see it swimming, I'll kill it. You know within watching the first several minutes of this film, that's going to be one hell of a ride. And what you don't see is scarier.
Something Blatty did for the storytelling of The Exorcist was exit early, arrive late, and it was very successful. And it's also successful here for Exorcist 3. This film is full of violent killings, but they're tastefully not shown in the beginning. Blatty or the editor could have easily shown the murders taking place or showed the dead bodies, but that would be too easy and it's not as frightening. Real fear is in the imagination. And that's what Blatty and the editor choose to do in the first half of this film. Leave it up to the viewers and the viewers imagination. It'll seem more real with your own interpretation. In the first half of the film, we get Kinderman telling the brutal murders to a colleague, and then the camera switches to the colleague to get the colleague's reaction. The killer drove an ingot into each of his eyes and cut off his head. Is this okay, Father? I can get you something else. Or vice versa. Kinderman arrives late, looks at the body under the blanket, and nearly tears up. <sighs> a flash of edits of the crime scene, you can piece the puzzle together yourself of what happened, which is actually scarier and far more effective than seeing Michael stab some horny teenager. What films do you know that has us investigate a crime scene, cuts away to establish mood, then cuts back to the investigation, all for the sake of revving up our internal fear? Nobody has the craft like these dudes have. Blatty's films can't be topped. It's the little details in Blatty's works that makes them great. Blatty even has Kinderman check both hands of the victim to identify if the Gemini killer was indeed the murderer, but there's no insert shot of each hand. That's truly brilliant and truly scary. You can see why this is one of Jeffrey Dahmer's favorite films. So after the mood has us on edge, and our frightened minds have been imagining the murders, the film kicks it up to another level. At the midpoint of the film, we now meet Patient X, or as he refers to himself as the Gemini Killer. It's a wonderful life. We're no longer going to arrive late, but now we're right on time. Blatty brilliantly progresses the story into a crescendo of fear as the audience will now see the murders and creepy shit in higher doses. Yet, you can still use your imagination to piece things together. Blatty built up the tension and starts paying it off with earned scares, both false and real. The Exorcist rarely relied on jump scares. It was mostly mood it set and the undertones that it built up from the get-go, slowly but surely. Nice. Exorcist 3 is set up in nearly the same way, but throws you curveballs from time to time. It can be just as uneasy as the original. It features some bizarre supernatural moments with statues and one creepy ass moment with Kinderman and Father President. It could be that exorcism. The McNeil kid. Hmm. Regan McNeil. Exorcism over on Prospect Street that Damien Garris did. The one that killed him. and probably one of the most frightening moments I've seen on film with the final exorcism at the end with Father Morning and the demon attacking him. This is one of the scariest movies ever made. One of those reasons why is the excellent script. There are some amazing one-liners that I constantly quote to myself. My God, the grammar. We're fine. Never mind. It's a wonderful life, in fact. I think the dead should shut up unless there's something to say. This isn't James Cameron, people. This is a smart horror film that people are sleeping on. Sometimes when I'm at my desk at night, I sigh, I rub my eyes, and I murmur, Damien. And I smile. There are great little moments like the chain-smoking Dr. Temple reciting what he wants to say before Kinderman arrives to his office. You had something to tell me? There's one character I like to talk about, and that's our determined protector, our main protagonist, Bill Kinderman. Bill is the perfect symbol and accumulation of the writing. Bill is funny, Bill can be philosophical, and Bill can be scared. I always love a film with a philosophical or theological debate going on. Exorcist 3 is no different than the original Exorcist when it comes to raising questions we don't necessarily have the answers to. While our children suffer, and our loved ones die, and your God goes waltzing blithely through the universe like some kind of cosmic Billy Burke, Bill, it all works out right. When? At the end of time. That soon. The film features some of the greatest dialogue I've ever heard not named Tarantino. The monologues like The Carp, which were originally featured in the Exorcist novel but didn't make it to that film, we get here in Exorcist 3. How about the subtext of The Carp? Swimming up and down. He can't stand it. The externalization of him going crazy because it's the anniversary of his friend's death, 
He has racist idiots for coworkers. He can't solve his current investigation and it's only gonna get worse. He'll always be on edge. Why? Because that's part of the job. Which I'll next transition into the award-worthy acting. George C. Scott and Brad Dorf contribute some of the greatest performances not nominated for the Academy Award. It's upsetting. Watch how real this reaction is from Scott. Context, Friedman is drilling him about the investigation of the hospital. Subtext, Kinnerman's friend just died. Go ahead, Lieutenant. Temple, why are you encouraging this? Shut your mouth! Excuse me. People will say that George C. Scott's performance is over the top, but I wholeheartedly disagree. It might be my number two performance right below Robert Shaw as Quint in Jaws. People are saying he's too over the top and this and that. I say this is a man dealing with a couple coworkers, some stupid, some prejudiced against his own background. It's normal to become irritated with these people. You know, I've been thinking, Lieutenant. This is new. Do we really need prints from the inside of the sliding panel? I mean, all you're going to get are the prints of the priest. Yes, I know. And what's the point? I'm padding the job. Scott puts in a far better performance than he did in The Changeling. On the flip side, his opponent, played by Brad Dorf, acts like his life is on the line if he doesn't do a good enough job. This dude puts on one hell of a performance. In this body, in this body in particular, in fact, ooh, let's call it revenge. He was so intimidating. A decapitated head can continue to see for approximately 20 seconds. So when I have one that's cocking, I always hold it up so that it can see its body. It's a little extra I throw in for no added charge. <laughs> and Dorf's entrance to the film has to be one of the greatest of all time. I won't spoil it if you haven't seen the movie. It's frightening stuff. Far more frightening than Hopkins and Lambs, which was released the same year and Hopkins won the Oscar for. I'm sorry, but Hopkins was just like a creepy uncle. Dorf was actually scary. He is inside with us. He will never get away. Even Jason Miller's appearance is enthralling as he sits there in his straitjacket reciting the details of the murders the Gemini killer did. I picked her up in Richmond and then I dropped her off at the city dump. Some of her, some of her I kept. This film features some of the most overlooked acting of all time. These dudes put on a clinic. Damien. No! This film would not have been made today. It's too good. This movie is wonderfully paced. Horror films today in the past couple decades have devolved from the slow pace, build the tension until the climax and pay it off like Rosemary's Baby, like The Exorcist. Instead, audiences today are in ADD mode. We want scares, 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 even sometimes from the start of the movie. Scary films nowadays rarely take their time to develop. Good thing Exorcist 3 does. Just watch this scene at the start of Act 2 where Kinnaman finds out how his friend was murdered. It's slow, it's methodical, and it's creepy. What are these? It's one of the greatest scenes ever crafted. Compare this film with its deliberately slow pacing. Father Dyer's entire blood supply. What? To a film that's eerily similar, but just in a different package, Seven. Seven takes Exorcist 3 and makes it louder, faster, and gives it more action. Instead of the bleakness we get in Exorcist 3, with the score so subtle we barely notice it weaved throughout. Tell the press that I am the Gemini Lieutenant. Final warning. Seven puts this boisterous music in. Oh my god, he's alive! Bam, 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 bam. <laughs> Seven, faster paced editing to make it seem more theatrical. Yeah. 
Seven actually never shuts up. There's score everywhere. Even when Morgan Freeman is throwing fucking knives. Sometimes less is more. Oh, you are issuing a clear invitation to the dance. Exorcist 3 has no tropes. Does Kinnaman seek an expert when he doesn't know something about the paranormal going on with his investigation? No. When the nurse repeats a line from the Gemini, Save your servant. Two, five. Right. That's just something our friend in cell 11 said one time. Save your servant. Kinnerman himself goes off and does the research. Save your servant who trusts in you, my God. Let him find in you, Lord, a fortified tower in the face of the enemy. Talk about actually being resourceful. Nowadays, pfft, forget it. Forget mood. Forget establishing unsettling undertones. Forget subtext like the massive amount featured in The Exorcist. You're gonna die up there. Body uses dreams in this movie as a pivotal point of externalization symbols and precognition, just like he did in 1971. Nowadays, people just want to go to the theater, be scared, and leave it there. We don't want to work for our scares. The victim's name is always starting with K, like Carl, his father. What's your name? I'm going to report you. My name is Amy Keating. William Peter Blatty, ahead of the curve. Right, I'm so sick of talking, I'll just let this section speak for itself. Trace, Trace Somerset. Hello. I'm very happy to meet you. I've heard a lot about you. Except, of course, your first name. <laughs> it's William. Oh, yeah? Well, let's both put this You really don't want me to play, huh? No, I do. Captain Howdy said no. Captain who? Captain Howdy. Who's Captain Howdy? You know, I make the questions and he does the answers. Oh, Captain Howdy, yeah. He's nice. Oh, I bet he is. Why didn't you unlock the door? You were Jackie knocking? Jody wouldn't let me. Jody? Who's Jody? She's my friend, and she comes to play with me. I watched some of the tapes on the camera, and I saw you talking oh. to somebody late, late last night. If you saw me talking to somebody, it will be Toby. <laughs> Toby's your friend? Yes. My daughter isn't depressed. Well, you, you mentioned her father and the separation. Um, Mom and Dad are officially divorced as of three months ago. Mom's not coming over for pancakes. Anna, that's enough. <laughs> I need out. I'm unfit. I think I've lost my faith, Tom. killer drove an ingot into each of his eyes. His attacker stabs him in both eyes.
once injected with a drug called succinacholine. They use it in electroshock therapy. But injecting 10 milligrams for each 50 pounds of body weight causes immediate and total paralysis. The kid couldn't move or scream while the killer was nailing and cutting him up. He was conscious? Yes. He was fully aware. He'd been injected with an opiate overdose. Couldn't move or feel much of anything. You mean he was alive? He was. Answer me now. <laughs> Inside of Reagan? <coughs> Janet, are you all right? <coughs> Please, Timmy. I'm afraid. Like this split. Like this split. William F. Kinderman, homicide. Uh, excuse me, Father. Can I have a word with you? Of course, Sergeant. Uh... What do you got? of the martyrs commands you. Vladdy's work in A Pitch of Freakin', time and time again, has been copied and rehashed. The current state of horror films today is in shambles. However, in 2016, there has been a slight resurgence of good horror with Green Room and Don't Breathe, in my opinion, leading us out of the darkness, as well as the collector's edition of Exorcist 3 finally being released on Blu-ray, which includes Legion, the director's cut of the film. And real quick, I just want to make a case for the inclusion of Jason Miller, Father Morning, and the exorcism in the theatrical versus them not being in the director's cut, which I think was a mistake. Jason Miller, the director's cut did not have him. The usage of him in the theatrical cut is excellent. It works far better than just having Dorf like in the director's. When the point in the theatrical switches from Miller to Dorf, it is so frightening and adds complexity. It also helps that Miller's performance was amazing from the get-go. But when we make the switch to Dorf, the film just rises up a full notch of intensity because Dorf goes balls out. It is fantastic stuff. Father Morning, the director's cut did not have him. I'm sure Blatty disliked including Morning. I mean, just look at his name, but I personally loved him. This dude has a badass look to him and performed very well. You corrupter of justice and innocence and youth. You begetter of death. His character in the 1988 draft was even better and had more screen time. There's also some disgusting gore involved this time around with Morning and the climax in the theatrical. And it was actually quite shocking and possibly one of the scariest things I've ever seen. 
The theatrical has the best climax of every version of Exorcist 3. Yes, the exorcism is climactic. When it cuts from the nurse falling down in pain and it cuts straight to Father Morning standing in the door frame as the doors slide open. And then a snap zoom of Karis's possessed yellow eyes is what I call a great movie moment. A turn of events, a badass entrance for a character, and a setup for what's to come in the highest peak of the story in the moment we've all been waiting for, all within a couple seconds time. That's great filmmaking. No other climax and ending is as satisfying as the theatrical. The duration of the exorcism is also longest in the theatrical. In the earlier scripts that had the exorcism went straight to the demon pushing morning into the walls. There's no actual rites being read or hallucinations happening. The setups are matched up with the resolutions better in the theatrical. Kinnerman has a resolution with his god problem with the I believe speech he gives as he's pinned against the wall. This is not included in the director's cut. So my last section, picking out certain aspects of all the versions of the story and placing them into one massive awesome movie. I've read and seen the following versions of this story. Legion, the novel from 1982, an undated screenplay, the 1988 screenplay, the 1989 screenplay, and I've seen the theatrical cut as well as the director's cut. So which version is the best? I'm going to say the theatrical cut. So I'm going to start with the theatrical and then flesh it out with more aspects I liked from the novel and the excellent earlier screenplays. I wish they kept the digging up of Kentry's head with Atkins on the boat from the 88 script. Then Kinnerman makes Atkins take the head to Kentry's mom to identify it. Include the following fleshing out like from the novel. Kentry's connection with Kinnerman some more. There's a poster in his office. Temple being a man whore. And Atkins being a good sidekick to Kinnerman. Bill asking about his family like in the novel. The last scene should be like in the novel where Atkins has replaced Dyer as Kinnerman's movie and dinner buddy. The 88 script had a lot of deleted humor. Pee Wee Herman is out then, which I wish it wasn't deleted. You gotta include the dialogue about Father President and his upcoming speech to Dyer during breakfast. This makes the jump scare with the secretary and Kinnerman work better because it gives clearer context. Maybe keep the deleted dialogue of the last name change joke of Julie in the kitchen. Fleshes out the family a bit more. Also keep Bill and his mother-in-law's rift. Wish they included Dyer being sad more often like in the 88 script and maybe add a bit more of his crying after the altar boy leaves. There's also a deleted mini scene with Dyer and Kinnerman watching It's a Wonderful Life and them crying or being sad. I wish they kept more dialogue in the restaurant like in the earlier drafts. What a wonderful man he was, Bill. So loving, so terribly kind. Keep the bye, Bill, from the 1988 script with the empty doorframe. Dyer's last words to Bill are met with empty comfort. It makes us feel sorry for the guy. In the 89 draft, I really like the moment of Ryan looking at Kinnaman mourning in Dyer's hospital room and Ryan feels compassion. It's a nice little moment for a character we kind of hate, but now we a little bit like now. Really wish they would have kept up the playing up and included more of the doctors being suspects like it was in the novel in the 88 script. The novel had dialogue that the doctors allowed the Gemini to escape to kill for the night. Also in the novel, Temple becomes a suspect because he worked on the original Gemini case. This added element also plays up the mystery, making it more grand and complex of a story. Did Temple get you out of this cell? Who gets you out? Just friends. There's a great shot of Cameron looking into the camera from the confessional after hearing news about Kentry being drugged. I wish they would have shot that and kept it. Include Kinnerman with his personal rivalry with crucifixes and God. It makes him deeper. I want to read you your rights. What a great line. Also keep the creepy giggle in the church with Kinnerman when he's all alone. <laughs> keep the extended nurse. Who stuck this guy? Scene. As well as the extended Mother India monologue from Kinnerman from the later drafts. Keep Kinnerman being a target like in the 88 script. Keep the Kinnerman deleted exterior scene right after Kevin. It plays up that Kinnerman is the Gemini's main target, adding more danger and heightening the story. Also the dialogue between Bill and Father President. You're the connection, like in the 88 script. And then it goes into... It could be that exorcism. I really like the trigger of the lights flickering and then the Gemini stirs up activity. This is played up really well in the 89 script, especially in the jump scare with Kinnerman and the secretary. You gotta keep Father Morning lacing throughout like in the 88 script, except the waking up from a dream in the first act. Have him in the hospital reading last rites before we really know about him. He just seems like a random priest at the time. But after we know who that was, it's a great little quiet entrance for the character. Keep the exposition from Father President about Morning being from Britain and on chaplain duty at the hospital. Also include a little mini scene where Kinnaman tries to talk to Father Morning between the library and Kinnaman reading at night, but Morning avoids him. You can't include the Brother Fane subplot, just have it like in the 88 script, but I would cut it. Father other president, Kinnerman in the library, and then Kinnerman alone in the library reading, and then Kinnerman in mourning, and then Kinnerman at home reading. Just don't mess up the epic transition in the theatrical. I think the man in cell 11 
is Damien Karras. So we go before the nightfall, patient X Kinnerman, Kinnerman with the file, Kinnerman unburies Karras, Kinnerman says, It isn't him. And then boom, the epic transition into, Is Damien Karras. Keep Kinnerman telling the policeman about the lockdown when he's with Temple. Also want to hear the dialogue between Kinnerman and the police guards in the disturb ward like it was in the novel. Just play it up a little bit more. Keep the senile, I like dinner, old man as a suspect for Keating's death. And then really quick, I have an extended cut. The beginning is cut together just like the 89 script and kind of like the director's cut. Georgetown 1973 with Karis out the window. And then we have the Karis deleted autopsy scene with the lights flickering indicating that Gemini has entered. And then the dream sequence opening credits. Also put Dyer walking through the steps after the altar boy leaves and include Damien. Right after Kinderman visits Dyer in the hospital, just like in the screenplay. Include Father Dyer joining Bill for dinner at Bill's place at night, and Dyer dances and faints just like in the undated screenplay. I like the imagery and also gives more context to Dyer's problems rather than him just being hospitalized out of the blue. Include Temple and his hypnosis of a patient. Include the director's cut, Kinderman seeing the Gemini's face for the first time, just as an alternative. Include the tragic Tommy, James, and shitty father backstory to flesh out the Gemini killer. Place this as a flashback when Kinderman is reading late at night and sees the file on the table. Include the multiple faces during the exorcism. And last, include the undated screenplay backstory of Kinderman wanting to be a priest but dropped out. This brings him and Dyer even closer. And in the resolution, he sees his sister, who's a nun, and comes full circle about his problem with God. And there you have it. Exorcist 3 is the greatest psychological thriller of all time. It's the smiles that keep us going, don't you think? And the second scariest film of all time, only second to... The Master. So go out, rent the movie, buy the Blu-ray, read the book, Legion, it's one hell of a ride. One day I hope to release a movie discussion called Why the Exorcist is the Greatest Film of All Time. But for now, I'm going to bed. Let me say my prayers. Pray for me, Damien. You're free.